Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. We're joined today in this video by members of the staff of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. Our member and admin coordinator, Kelly Ross, is hosting the call and coordinating technology. Our music director, Bob Fusen, has worked hard this week to take the piano tracks that Bill Carpenter laid down last week and add in vocals from our choir director, Julie Ennerson. Several of us are present in the chat room running beside this video uh, on Sunday morning. Chelsea Kraftgar, Director of Religious Education, is here uh, with several readings, and Jean Helms is here as well. We also have lay pastoral care folks on call this morning, so if you need somebody to talk to, reach out and we will get you in contact with one of them. All right. We're still practicing this new way of being together. It's been a month now since we've had a service in our building. And while it remains a time of anxiety, this is also a time of possibility. We're all learning a lot very quickly about how to be a church in this new way of being both together and apart. Lots is changing very quickly. But what has not changed is the vision of this church. That we aspire to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration, to transform ourselves and the world. And that vision begins with welcome. So whether this is your first time here in these electronic spaces, or your, I suppose, fifth now, if you've stumbled onto this YouTube video by accident, if you are researching it for a term paper 30 years from now about how churches responded to the coronavirus pandemic, you are welcome here with us. If you came here hopeful or heartbroken, whatever your age, gender, skin color, whomever you love, you are welcome here with us. More than ever, it's important that we share the warmth, love, and light of this place. So our ask to you is simple. Do not keep this church, this community, a hidden gem. Invite people to come be a part of this community. The business of the church is connection and connection is what we need right now. So if you have family, if you have friends around the country, share this place with them. Tell them to join us on Sunday morning. Tell them to drop by on Thursday night. Tell them to come to one of our open office hours. Every tool we have as a church is being used to connect people with each other in this moment. And you have all been doing that the last month. And we will keep doing that. So help us by continuing to do that work of connection. As we enter into worship, take a moment and center yourself. Wherever you are, find a comfortable place, I hope in your home, take a couple deep breaths, and let us begin. Our chalice lighting words this morning are by the Reverend Gretchen Haley. She writes, excuse me. Someone has to be the one to go first. When the seas are stubborn and the ground and sky are giving us only gray and gloom, someone has to see the spring that's just below the surface, the crocus about to launch, the green in the brown grass, the path that's about to be made clear, the freedom that's calling beyond the leap, the leaving behind, the letting go of everything you ever knew and anything it meant to live. It takes a reckless sort of dreaming, a courage you'd usually shrug off like it belonged to old tales of escape from Egypt or emperors, like it belonged to someone more powerful, more official, someone less filled with grocery lists and bills to pay, marriages to manage and all those reports to read we come to link arms and to claim a call that is collective, believing we can go together and hold each other into the deep, into this journey for justice and liberation, trusting we can sing, not just at the end, but the whole way there. 
feeling in our bodies this promise of something more beautiful being born. We come to remind each other we were always this brave. We are all, we've had all we need to walk this way the whole time. That we are the ones we've been waiting for to say to each other, let's begin now. Come, let us worship together. Our opening hymn is number 188 in the gray hymnal, or just the words that are on the screen. The hymn is Come, Come, Whoever You Are, and it is a pleasure to be able to say that over the last week, um, folks from the church have done enormous work to make these recordings possible. So thanks to, to Bob and to Bill and to Julie and everybody involved. This is Come, Come, Whoever You Are. This reading comes to us from Victoria Safford and it's called Desert Spring. They had no idea where they were going when they left that night in the dark without lights, without shoes, without bread, their children smothered against them so they could make no noise. They had no idea what they were getting into following this Moses, this wild eyed one who claimed visions and made promises, but who after all could guarantee them nothing except death if they were caught. They had no idea, these slaves, what it could mean, this promise of land, their own country and life abundant. Of freedom, they knew nothing except what they could taste by living its opposite, slavery. And that taste became a hunger and that hunger became insatiable till they were ravenous for freedom. And they went out then, but no one knows to this day whether they were led by Moses or by the outstretched arm and mighty hand of something else, of something eternal, as they would afterwards and always claim, or whether their own human hungry will made them flee that night from Pharaoh. They went into the wilderness. There they wandered 40 years, which in those days was a lifetime, 40 was a good old age, so many of them died before getting anywhere, and many were born in the desert and grew to adulthood knowing nothing but the journey, not slavery, not freedom, just the going. They whined and complained and muttered and some mutinied for they were a stiff-necked and rebellious people. You can read it for yourself. Ungrateful people, even when manna rained down from heaven and quails were sent to feed them. Unhappy people longing out loud even for the familiar security of Egypt of all places, where at least they knew what to expect, 
as awful as it was. Impatient people making cheap little idols and gods of metal to bargain with in secret when the traveling god got hard or merely dull. And the days and years became monotonous. In the springtime, we remember. The promised land is not a destination. It is a way of going. The land beyond the Jordan, that country of freedom and dignity and laughter, you carry it inside you all the while. It is planted in your mind and heart already before you ever start out, before it even occurs to you that in order to leave that life in Egypt, the intolerable bondage of that life, what you need to do is stand up and walk forward. They had no idea where they were going as they fled Egypt, running into the wilderness without time to let their bread rise. No idea other than to know that to stay was deadly. Passover ended a few nights ago, and because of its overlap with Easter this year, we're talking about it today. It was a holiday of remembrance in the Jewish tradition, remembering the foundational story of the Torah. Once we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, now we are free. And here's an important part about Passover. This is not the way the story is supposed to be told. It's not a story for a worship service with a hundred people gathered in a morning listening to a preacher or a rabbi speak, certainly not a hundred people gathered around computer screens listening to somebody speak through a screen. The holiday is celebrated at home, around a dinner table, over a meal. Seders are beautiful things. A holiday meal with all that entails endless arguments about politics and family dynamics and general appreciation of the miracle of my it's a ball soup. And as you eat at a Seder and argue with family and celebrate, the story gets told every year. That is the, the essence of the holiday of Passover is to remember and tell the story to each generation. How a group of slaves in Egypt were freed through miraculous divine intervention. How plagues were visited on Egypt as Pharaoh's heart was hardened. How the former slaves fled across the desert without any time to think about what was happening until they were suddenly, shockingly, free of everything that they had known. This has been a strange Passover. For a holiday that nearly as much as Thanksgiving, maybe more so, has food and family at its heart, we have all found ourselves far from family. And time is strange these days. We've been joking in staff meetings that time is a flat circle, that every day seems to bleed together. I didn't even realize it was Passover when we were grocery shopping last week. So Stacy and I came home with a 12 pound ham and we've been eating leftovers all week long, which if you're keeping count at home means that this was the least kosher Passover you could possibly have in the Sinclair house. So in some ways this last week has felt disconnected from the holiday I know. And at the same time, we're mostly confined to our homes, fearful of a plague stalking the land. We've taken this huge leap into the unknown and are feeling our way into new ways of being that neither we nor anybody we know has any idea where it will end up. It's not exactly disconnected from the story of the holiday. In some ways, it feels like we've never been closer to the story. And Victoria Safford describes they had no idea where they were going when they left that night in the dark, without lights, without shoes, without bread. 
their children smothered against them so they would make no noise. We're in it right now, because what has this last month been other than leaving what we were doing with no idea of where we were going or how long it will take us to get there? It's a story of uncertainty and one of hope that in the midst of profound and unsettling change, a people might be transformed. Once we were slaves in Egypt, now we are free. The other piece of the holiday that is shared with what we do every Sunday is that it's a story that it's at once universal and deeply personal. The, the commandment on Passover is, is to each experience the story on our own. To each read the story and imagine our roles in it. Because the truth is we have all celebrated and we have all mourned and we have all worried about what is to come. And so as this next song plays, and you sing along with it and with Julie, please type your name or the name of somebody you, you are carrying in your heart with joy or with sorrow in the chat box just to, just to the side of this video. Our next hymn is number 1002, Comfort Me.
Our next reading is anonymously written and comes from the Corona Gadah, a Passover Haggadah for this new age of plague. If he had given us doctors and nurses, it would have been enough, Dayenu. If he had given us doctors and nurses, but not given us amazing teachers, Dayenu. If he had given us amazing teachers, but not given us the internet, Dayenu. If he had given us the internet, but not given us Instacart and Zoom, Dayenu. If he had given us Instacart and Zoom, but not given us Burks, Fauci, and Sarah Cody, Dayenu. If he had given us Burks, Fauci, and Cody, but not given us Inslee, Newsom, and Cuomo, Dayenu. If he had given us Inslee, Newsom, and Cuomo, but not given us truckers and grocery clerks, Dayenu. God bless them all. There are traditionally several glasses of wine at a Passover Seder. Now, kosher wine, at least in my experience, is not the best wine in the world. But after the third glass, ritually quaffed and blessed, it gets better. And towards the end of the night, once the meal is over and the family arguments are either over or in dire need of redirection for another year. That's when everybody starts singing. Dainu, it would have been enough. In the version that I know best, it's a song that retells the story of the Exodus step by step. If God had freed us from Egypt, but not fed us manna in the desert, it would have been enough. If God had fed us manna in the desert, but not given us the Torah, it would have been enough. If God had given us Torah, but not led us to the promised land, it would have been enough. Dainu, Dainu, Dainu. And this is a highly, highly condensed version of the song. There are at least 14 verses, each followed by a rousing chorus of Dainu. It is, when sung in Hebrew, the very pious version of 99 bottles of beer on the wall. And there's an implication to the song, though in the midst of raucous family time. It would have been enough. So if God had not given us manna in the desert, not led us to the promised land, that would have been enough. It is a song of gratitude for enormous abundance, but it is also an acknowledgement that abundance is not what is required. You know where this is going, I imagine. What is the Dainu to sing right now? In this moment, when we're all spending a whole lot of nights with our families, while much of what we usually do is unavailable, what do we have to sing out thanks for? For each other, for health, for food on the table, days in April with snow on the ground because it's Nebraska and Four days of sun in April, that would have been enough. Cultivating gratitude is not just the work of happy and easy times. It is the, the work of all times. There's a story that Daniela Greenbaum Davis writes about this holiday, about her family's way of telling the story. She writes this. Jewish tradition famously demands that the participants at the Passover Seder bemoan the depredations of slavery and celebrate the salvation of freedom as if they have themselves had escaped from Egypt. For our generation, sitting in the comfort of our dining rooms, this can feel like an exercise in absurdity. Such hardship seems incredibly remote. But for my family, this recollection of suffering and redemption has served as our Seder's most moving moment, thanks to my grandmother and her remarkable story. Until recently, I spent every Passover in Israel with my extended family. So long as he was able, my grandfather led the Seder, taking us through each segment, 
with erudite and academic commentary. He was a serious, quietly commanding force who could easily have led the entire affair, but each and every year he would pause and hand the reins over to my grandmother, Masha, when we reached the time to sing Avedim Hyenu. The song consists of a single refrain. We were once slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Now we are free. And every year, my grandmother would tell her own story of Exodus. A Lithuanian Jew, Masha knew the experience of slavery firsthand, having spent the years of World War II in various ghettos, ammunition factories, and concentration camps. In March of 1945, in the Nazi-operated Bergen-Belsen, Masha, her sister, and their mother, for whom I am named, and several others, sat down to conduct a Seder of sorts. Without food, wine, prayer books, or even a table, they did their best to remember the liturgy and engage in some sort of ritual normality. Somehow they spoke of the bread of affliction that their ancestors ate, despite the fact that they too were afflicted and had no proper bread to eat. Somehow they proclaimed, let all who are hungry come and eat, despite their own hunger and lack of food. Somehow they spoke of how Pharaoh embittered the lives of his Jewish slaves, though they too were Jewish slaves whose lives had been impossibly embittered. But when it was time to sing Avedim Hayenu, they found themselves smothered by an impenetrable silence. How could they, in the concentration camp, sing of slavery in the past tense and celebrate their supposed freedom? How could they rejoice in a sovereignty and an independence that simply did not exist? It was too painful to even be comical, yet somehow, summoning strength and a faith that I cannot fa fathom, they began to sing. One day they hoped they would once again sing this song from the comforts of a dining room and be able to genuinely understand, to celebrate the transition from slavery to freedom. One day they prayed they would be able to sing of slavery in the past tense and retell, as they are commanded to do, the story of the Exodus. For millions that perished at the hands of the Nazis, including Masha's father, this dream would never become a reality. A few weeks after Passover that year, Masha developed typhus. She was sent to the Nazis infirmary, fully knowing that if she failed to recover within three days, she would die, either from illness or otherwise. On Saturday night, she awoke to the sound of a man speaking over the camp's loudspeaker. He was reciting the Havdalah, the prayer that concludes Shabbat and ushers in a new week. Delirious with fever, Masha was convinced that she had died and entered into some bizarre prelude to heaven. Liberation did not cross her mind, but in reality, one week earlier, on April 15th, 1945, the British Army had liberated Bergen-Belsen. The man on the loudspeaker, Avraham Greenbaum, was one of four Jews serving as chaplains in the British Army. Within a year, he would become her husband. The first words she heard him say were those of the Havdalah, a prayer all about transitions. The text concludes by blessing God for differentiating between holy and mundane. Like the story of the Exodus, it was about new beginnings. The story of the Exodus is about new beginnings and endings and the long, long time in between those two things. The 40 years spent in the desert, not sure where we're going or when we're going to get there, but having faith that we will. It's not a mistake that Passover happens in spring. When we know that the world outside is going to turn green, and because we live in Nebraska, on April 16th, we get a winter weather warning and it snows four inches overnight. That does not mean that spring is not coming. 
That does not mean that the green isn't there. That doesn't mean that winter won't end. The holiday is one about transitions. And so as we go forward this spring, we go forward in hope. Even though we don't know necessarily where the path will lead or how long it will take. Amen. We're going to turn to Jean Helms now for a couple announcements as we transition to the end of the service. I do have a few announcements as we move to a close of our time together this morning. First, the Board of Trustees met last Tuesday and voted for the church to remain closed through the end of the church year, June 15th. And secondly, this is a Share the Plate Sunday for Planned Parenthood of the Heartland. And we have created an easy way for you to give to Share the Plate from the comfort of your own home. You may have seen in the Friday e-blast that we now have a new text giving option. It is very easy. The number you text is 73256. We may have a visual for you here in a moment. The body of your text will have our acronym UCLINCOLN, UC Lincoln, and then a space, and then the amount you wish to give. Be sure to select Share the Plate from the list of options that you will have pop up next so that your money goes to the right place. And I want to let you know I tested this out last week and it really is very easy. You will receive confirmation via text and email that your contribution was successful. Our final hymn is number 1028, The Fire of Commitment. And as the hymn begins, please consider a donation to Planned Parenthood as a part of our Share the Plate program.
So one word before we conclude. June 15th. That means that we're going to be here for a little while. We're going to be in this setting on YouTube and on Zoom for longer than we had anticipated, if you had asked me when we closed. And what that allows us to do is plan well for the rest of the church year. The board's decision allow, allows our staff to think about this time intentionally, just, not just responding to events, but really planning a program, assuming that we'll be in this setting. And I don't know if we'll be back in July. I don't think anybody does right now. We'll keep looking at it as a leadership team, as a staff, as a board. We'll depend on what the city tells us, what the state tells us. And when it's time to come back together, we will joyfully. So much like spring, we don't know exactly when it's going to come, but we do know that it is. At some point we will be back together in person. And until then, we are going to do our best in this setting to be a church together and apart. For now, we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of love, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until we are together again. Be at peace, beloveds, and amen.